Grinner. I have to get out. The walls, twisted rebar and cracked concrete, seem to stretch on forever. I can't remember where I am, why I came to be here. I can't even remember my last name. All I know is that if I get out, I will live. If I don't, I have to get out. I can hear it behind me, that accursed chuckle echoing down the hallway. Oh God, it's coming for me. An exit to the right. My jog becomes a sprint once again, a parade ground drum booming in my ears. South close. I'm yards away, feet from the door. Suddenly, ground. My face smacks into the dirted concrete hard enough to feel something break. I turn, looking for the object that tripped me. Blood gushes from my nose, staining my shirt and pants, but I don't have time to care. One thought takes control of all others. One motive guides my body with an otherwise unnatural will. I have to get out. In my frenzied state it takes me a moment to focus on the figure limping slowly towards me, to realize the danger. He is tall, thin as a corpse and white as a sheet. His dark suit is immaculate, his long limbs seeming to stretch beyond the right proportions. A long black cane, topped with a metal figurehead, is clenched tight in his fist, two long fingers overlapping the pommel like a bad Halloween glove. Wispy white hair cascades around his balding cranium, draping over his shoulders like unkempt vines. His face is the worst, with few features that seem to only highlight the wrongness of the absent ones. Twin ovals set deep into the two high eye sockets. Twin pits from the abyss stare into me, into my soul. His smile is too large, too wrong. Overcrowded teeth line a lipless maw that stretches the length of his head. Saliva leaks through gaps in his teeth caught by the polite tapping of a kerchief in his free hand. The fiend takes a few steps towards me, his gait awkward, like a teenager that hasn't quite come to grips with a gross spurt. I back up, turn, furiously crawling toward the door, crawling toward my salvation. I grasp the handle, pull madly at the doorknob. The door swings open, to reveal, nothing. A wall, like something out of a lurid comic strip, lies before me. Crudely daubed on the surface is a pictogram of a smiling face, surrounded by tally marks that are too numerous to count. The pigment dried as a dark brown, but I know its original color would have been red. Sanguine. A titter, a mad giggle from behind me. Awkward footsteps, helped by a cane close the already negligible distance between us. Oh God, I can't get out. Closer. Like every other parent, mine had always wanted to take pictures of precious moments. Most of them consist of me with food on my face and other cliches. I recently found a box of these photos. They were all old Polarods, I still have the camera that was used to take them. I took a stack of the pictures out of the box and started looking through them. About halfway through the stack I noticed something, a small, black smudge. I thought it was just something on the lens but it seemed to appear in every photo and gradually got bigger as I grew older within the pictures. I had finished that stack and decided to move on to the next. And there it was again, that same black spot in the corner. I quickly flipped through them, eyes barely grazing over the picture before changing into the next. I had gone through about eight years' worth of pictures when I started to see something in the black spot. Outlines of something that was barely visible. I looked closely at each photograph, trying to find out what it was. Like always, as I progressed it got closer and closer. I gasped as I looked at one picture, what I initially thought was just a smudge had turned into a face. It was slightly transparent, it had two large pits for eyes, a big, wide, toothy, evil-looking grin. It was so close, much closer than it had ever been. The mass was hovering behind my smiling twelve-year-old self. I dropped the picture back into the box. That was the last picture I had ever taken. It's been three years since that picture. I closed my eyes, breathed out, then got up and put the box away. I walked back to my room and steered clear of mirrors and any other reflective surfaces. I sat at my desk and opened up my desk drawer. I looked down and saw it, the camera that had taken all of those pictures. I grabbed it and held it in front of me, facing me. I took a deep breath. One, two, three, click. 
the picture slide up from the slit and started developing. I took it out and set it on the desk. I waited and waited, the picture slowly coming into view. I got up from the desk and walked over to my bed, grabbing my book and slowly making my way to the desk. I set the book down gently and closed my eyes. I patted around for the picture. Once found, I picked it up and held it in front of my face. I quickly opened my eyes and screamed. I didn't see me. I saw nothing of mine. All I saw was that face. Distorted Warning Signals When I got the first one, I was literally seconds away from stepping onto the plane when a call from, unknown, blared from my cell phone. It was a ringtone I hadn't heard before, one I was pretty sure hadn't come with the phone. Normally, I wouldn't have stopped to answer it, but I was expecting a call about a job I had interviewed for the previous week. I took a deep breath in and accepted the call. Hello? Do not get on the plane. A woman's voice, garbled and strange, as if her vocal cords had been shredded, and she was trying desperately to choke out speech. Despite the unnerving, fractured quality of her voice, her tone was insistent and eerily calm. Then the call ended. I froze. I had always had a slight phobia of air travel, and something about this call just, there's no way I was about to get on a seven-hour flight now. I turned around and headed toward the food court. I'd just get another flight later in the afternoon, I figured. I watched from the airport Starbucks three hours later as every TV in the terminal lit up with the crash footage of the plane I should have been on. No survivors. Not a single one. I tried to trace the call. So did the police. But there was nothing to trace. There was no evidence my phone had ever received a call around that time. They analyzed phone records, incoming and outgoing communication to my phone nothing. I wasn't making it up. I couldn't have been. That wasn't the only call. Throughout the years, they were few and far between, but always right. And I always listened. Do not go on that blind date tonight. Five months later, my would-be date was convicted of killing four women, all with my hair color and build. Found them in a shallow grave about 250 feet from the diner he offered to take me to. Do not drive to the concert tonight. Eighteen-wheeler lost control and plowed into a line of cars. Every driver crushed. Every driver killed. In the stretch of freeway I would have been driving down. No matter if I got a new phone, if I moved across the country, the calls would still come. I could almost feel the presence of, whatever it was, whatever it is, watching over me. I imagined being at the bottom of the freezing ocean, still strapped into my coach section plane seat, or being in that mass grave across from the diner, or watching an 18-wheeler skidding toward my car, knowing death was imminent, and I'd get this tightness in my chest. I'd think about how thin that line was, how close I'd gotten. If I hadn't had a job interview I was waiting to hear back from, I'd have never listened to that first call. And that would be it for me. It always felt like something was coming for me. But there was always this, this fractured, warped voice, with these calls that never seemed to exist after I heard them. Self-destructing warning signals, rotting away before my eyes. And I was alive. I had a bad feeling about this cruise. I had planned it as a girl's week out with some of my old friends from college, and was looking forward to a week in the tropics in the dead of winter. But part of me could almost sense that the call was coming. Maybe I'd watched Titanic one too many times, but there was a little nagging fear from the start. I hoped it would be fine, but I knew that if something was going to happen, I'd get the call. I'd know. Now, a week before I'm set to go on the cruise, after stepping into my apartment after returning from dinner with a friend, I notice my cell has a message from, unknown. They've never had to leave a message before. Haven't checked it all night. Damn it and I had really wanted to go on that cruise, too. Ah, well, not worth whatever horrific fate awaited me in that cold, dark ocean. I click, play message, and feel my stomach drop as I listen to the voice, sounding horrifically distorted, as if it emanates from a throat slashed to ribbons, crackling with more urgency than ever before. I look around my apartment as the voice on the phone repeats the same phrase over and over again. 
Do not come home after dinner tonight. Do not come home after dinner tonight. Do not come home after dinner tonight. A warning about silence. Everyone, regardless of their particular mental state, has a curious kind of background noise in their minds. When that noise takes the form of original music, we call it being a genius. When it sounds like voices, we tend to call it schizophrenia. A single voice is often referred to as religion. Most people go through their entire lives without ever being consciously aware of this omnipresent oral phenomenon, save for in those rare moments when it catches their attention. Perhaps they think they've heard their name being called, or that they've been listening to the air rushing through the vents in their house. One way or another, though, the noise is there. You can hear it if you listen for it. Lie down in a quiet room and focus on clearing your mind. Mute your internal monologue, erase the scenes from your imagination, and let yourself sink into the silence. Before long, the whispers of that hidden soundtrack will become evident, then grow louder as you learn to recognize them. It could be that you'll find answers to questions you didn't even know you were asking, or perhaps discover a sense of inner peace that had been lacking in your life. Some folks refer to this as meditation, even if they're mistaken about what's really going on. The truth, you see, is much less comforting. If you've ever gone walking in the woods, you've likely encountered a cacophony of noises. The songs of birds, the chirping of insects, and the quiet rustles of small animals rushing through the undergrowth become so commonplace that our minds tend to tune them out. What we notice, though, is what happens when a predator draws near. The chorus abruptly stops. The forest becomes deathly still. A person walking amidst that sudden silence might feel the hairs on the back of their neck start to rise, and notice their heart pounding with a mixture of adrenaline and dread. When you listen to the sounds in your mind, it doesn't matter what form they take. What matters is that you can hear them at all. As long as that clamor is present, you know that you're safe. All is well, even in the most tumultuous of times. The danger arises when that noise seems to stop when you suddenly experience the most potent silence that you have ever encountered. In that moment, you may start to feel as though you are being watched. After all, in that still forest, the predator is the quietest of all. Try it for yourself, if you'd like. When next you are completely alone, imagine you are listening to a sound of some kind. When that sound seems to stop, you'll know that you've been noticed. The Window I was in my bedroom, doing the typical at-home teenager thing, staying up late, digging around the depths of the internet, and generally not paying attention to anything other than what was on my monitor. It was the early morning, around two o'clock, and everyone in my house was asleep but me. The room was nice and warm despite it being the dead of winter, since we had the windows replaced last week. We had been losing heat, especially in my bedroom, through some old storm windows, but the bitter cold was now kept outside. I don't remember what I was doing. I think in the terror that consumed me I must have forgotten. I heard a noise at my window. Not the sound of a bug flying into it, or the shrubs brushing against it. No, this was an odd noise, a thumping sound, something I had never heard before. I didn't think anything of it initially. Whether that was because I genuinely believed it was nothing or because I didn't want to find out what it was, I can't say, but I sat there for a moment and just listened to it. It was distinctly rhythmic. Thump, thump, thump. It only lasted 15 seconds or so, and then stopped. I shuddered, but shrugged it off, and, after spending another hour or two browsing and consciously not looking toward the window, turned my computer off and fell into an uneasy but uneventful sleep. This morning, After the sun had been up for a few hours and the things that go bump in the night were doing whatever they do during the daylight hours, I walked to my window and spent a few minutes trying to replicate the sound I had heard. I tapped the window, bumped it with some soft objects, even locked and unlocked it, but I couldn't for the life of me figure out what had made the sound. Nothing I did was even close. I figured that the event had been a fluke, and the day was normal until this evening. My dad arrived home from work at the usual time and decided that the house was too stuffy, so he came into my room and went to open the window, where in Texas, 
so winter evenings are sometimes very comfortable, as was the case today. Never in my life before that moment have I genuinely wished to be deaf. My dad forgot to unlock the window before trying to open it, and when he pulled up, it produced the same noise I heard last night. My window only has handles on the inside. The Voice If you ever are in an area of absolute quiet, still your breathing and move not a muscle. After a few seconds you will notice that the silence has a sort of sound of its own, a kind of empty ringing tone. This is nothing unique. Everyone will hear this, given the proper setting. An informed person will tell you that your brain is trying to interpret the lack of stimuli to your hearing, and so creates a bit of a filler sound. This ringing sound actually serves a more arcane purpose, covering up a noise we are not meant to hear. This noise is not impossible to hear, and if you are persistent you can effectively break the cover-up sound. The next time you are silent and hear the ringing, shout at the top of your lungs for about half a minute, then be abruptly silent. It will be different for everyone. Some will hear nothing different for dozens of tries. Others might pick up soft murmuring. A special few auditory heroes might clearly make it out on the first attempt. What you will hear is a voice that relays an account of events about to happen in the immediate future. It's like a sportscaster relaying the events occurring ten seconds into the future. As time goes on, you will be able to make out this voice under increasingly noisy circumstances, to the point that it can be heard at any time by just concentrating. Such ability would doubtlessly be invaluable, no? You will be able to react to any immediate danger, relate to people around you with greater ease. No one would ever surprise you. Now, of course, you are wondering what sort of horrible catch this ability entails. Perhaps the tone of the voice is so horrible that it will drive you mad, or maybe the voice will only predict your death over and over again. Of course, this isn't the case, though. It's a normal voice. Your ears receive it no matter what, and it's simply a matter of noticing. But there is a danger. For you see, where there is a voice, there is a body. And just like you will notice new sounds, so shall you notice new sights. More importantly, you will be noticed. Seems to be a more fleshed-out version of the ringing, and since I really love the concept of that one, I wanted to post this one as well. Which do you prefer? We danced. Footsteps aren't an uncommon thing to hear when you're sitting in a basement, so I think nothing of it when I hear quiet thuds coming from my upstairs hallway. I just assume it's my brother, and continue doing whatever pointless little thing I was doing at the time. They go on for another couple minutes, and I'm starting to get pissed off. They keep getting louder and louder and I sigh, wondering what the hell my brother's doing this late at night. I sit there, because it's impossible to focus with the racket. I mean, it sounds like someone's power walking all over my main floor. I sit there and listen as the thumps get faster and wilder. They just keep moving, almost starting to form a rhythm. They move even faster and get even wilder, and they're thumping all over my main floor. I realize that whatever this is, it can't be human. No human can move like that. What the fuck? I finally yell. After that, all the noises stop. Everything is quiet for a moment, and then I hear calm, slow footsteps moving to my basement door. The door is pushed open, and the footsteps stop again. I listen to my breathing for the next three minutes, then sigh, thinking it's over. Turns out something else was listening, too. Suddenly I hear it thudding down the stairs, and I knock my chair over in my haste to stand up. I start to run towards the nearest closet, just in time to see a grotesque, hairless, four-legged creature, dancing towards me, tapping its swollen feet in an intoxicating rhythm. I dive into the closet and slam the door shut. There's a half-second pause and then I hear that same rhythm on the door. It just keeps going and going with no pause, no rest, no relief. He's been at it for hours now, and I find myself tapping my fingers along with his song. But then, just as suddenly as it began, it ends. I wait for a few moments, then look out. He's gone. I flip on a light and fall into a chair. It's safe. I relax and think for a few moments. But then I notice my foot tapping. 
Maybe this song isn't so bad, I almost like it enough to dance to it. So I drop down on my hands and feet, and I start. <laughs> 